Imagine opening Google Earth and zooming in on a landmass as vast as Western Europe, yet not a single river winds through it. This is Saudi Arabia, home to 35 million people. Towering skyscrapers, sprawling date farms, and vast oil fields all dependent on water in a kingdom where the sky delivers just 65 millimeters of rain a year, less than London gets in a single week. And yet, taps still gush. Fountains still dance, and wheat once grew here for export. So how does a country with no rivers keep 35 million people hydrated? And how long can this water illusion last before nature catches up? Let's dive into one of the world's driest and boldest survival stories. Saudi Arabia is a land of extremes, ancient traditions alongside futuristic ambition. It's home to Mecca, the holiest site in Islam, and Neom a planned city of AI, vertical farms, and artificial rain. Beneath its deserts lie fossil aquifers and billion-year-old rock. Above them, a sun so intense it powers solar mega-projects and scorches away nearly every drop of rain. Yet, despite its size, Saudi Arabia has no permanent rivers. Look down from the International Space Station, and Saudi Arabia looks scratched by pale tree roots. Those roots are wadis ancient riverbeds that roar with flash floods a few hours a year, then fall silence for months. Wadi Hanifa, stretching through Riyadh, is the most famous of these ghost rivers. Channels that flood briefly then vanish within a day into limestone or superheated air. Why does water vanish so quickly here? Because geography conspires against its permanence. Much of the kingdom sits on the Arabian Shield, a gently tilted Precambrian block that gives rain no steep gradient to accelerate surface flow. The Hijaz and Asir mountain chains catch Red Sea moisture, but their streams plunge quickly westward to the coast. East of the divide, air heated by the Arabian high descends, crushing cloud columns before they can mature. Climatologists estimate the national average rainfall between 59 to 70 millimeters annually. Compare that to the evaporation rate, more than 3,000 millimeters annually across much of the interior. In practice, any puddle has to outrun the sun to reach the gulf before evaporating. Even perennial springs disappear underground, re-emerging as salty seeps kilometers away. No wonder the CIA World Factbook labels Saudi Arabia the largest country without a river. Yet, human life thrives here, depending largely on groundwater pumped from aquifers tens or even hundreds of meters below. Farmers in Al Qarsh tap the same fossil reservoirs to feed date palms older than living memory. But these practices drain water laid down during wetter prehistoric epochs, finite liquid savings accounts. As usage grows, the kingdom must confront a reality. Without natural rivers, every drop used today must be borrowed from the sky, the sea, or the buried past, buying time for the future or engineered survival. Now, rewind the desert clock 12,000 years. A cooler planet tugged African monsoon rains northward, and the empty quarter blossomed into grassland. Using satellite radar, archaeologists traced a 400-kilometer-long paleo channel, dubbed the Kuwait River, stretching from the Hijaz Mountains toward today's Persian Gulf. Along its banks, researchers have discovered Arshulian stone tools and fossil hippo teeth, proof that big mammals and early humans hunted near steady water. Sediment cores drilled beneath dunes reveal pollen from oak, tamarind, and savanna grasses signaling a humid window when annual rainfall may have surpassed 300 millimeters, five times modern values. Hydrologists estimate some paleo rivers rivaled the Seine or the Thames, but Earth's axial wobble eventually weakened summer insulation, monsoon belts retreated, and by around 3000 BCE, Arabia entered a drying spiral. The rivers silted, lakes shrank, and dunes marched across abandoned deltas. A 2025 Nature paper mapped 11 distinct paleo drainage networks under Saudi sands, some stretching 800 kilometers, and dated their final flows to between 9 and 6,000 years ago. Each new LiDAR sweep uncovers hearth cycles, obsidian knives, even elephant footprints, reminding us that today's deserts once served as a green migration corridor linking Africa and Eurasia. Why didn't later rains revive those rivers? Because the tectonic tilt, combined with relentless evaporation, makes hydrological resurrection almost impossible under present-day climates. Even in exceptionally wet El Niño years, wadis deliver only transient torrents before they sink or boil away. Knowing this vanished wetland past adds urgency. Aquifiers that many Saudis pump right now were banked during those prehistoric monsoon eras. 
Once emptied, modern skies are unlikely to refill them on human timescales. So when you see a garden in Riyadh or a fountain in Jeddah, remember, it drinks the echo of ancient rains that vanished from the sky. Fast forward to the present and watch global circulation throttle Saudi rainfall. It straddles latitude 16 to 32 degrees north beneath the descending limb of the Hadley cell. Air that's rose wet over the equator sinks here as the Arabian high, compressing, warming, and killing clouds. That's why Jeddah receives only around 52 millimeters of rain annually, while the Rubb al Khali interior logs virtually none. When storms do break, though, they hit hard. In November 2023, a convective system dumped a year's rain on Jeddah in 12 hours, flooding highways and briefly turning wadis into rivers. Yet hydrologists monitoring Wadi Hanifa found 80% of peak discharge seeped underground or evaporated within a single day. Climate models project even sharper extremes, fewer rainy days but fiercer cloudbursts. Saudi meteorologists responded by launching a national cloud seeing program in 2022. By 2023, they had flown 415 sorties, releasing hydroscopic flares above the Hejaz and Najd ranges. Saudi officials estimate these operations yielded 4 billion cubic meters of additional precipitation, a helpful though modest buffer. However, independent verification of these gains remains limited. Yet one pocket defies the pattern. Before oil made Saudi Arabia rich, water shaped its very survival. For centuries, isolated communities relied on ingenuity to coax life from the desert. One of the oldest solutions was the afflage system. Underground tunnels sloped just enough to let gravity draw groundwater from aquifers to surface farms and villages. These kanad style channels date back thousands of years, and over 3,000 are still mapped across the kingdom today. Some continue to irrigate date groves in Al Asa, one of the oldest continually inhabited oases in the world. But the modern era changed everything. With petrodollars pouring in by the late 20th century, Saudi Arabia shifted from ancient conservation to industrial extraction. Engineers installed diesel and turbine pumps capable of reaching deep into fossil aquifers. Water reserves deposited during wetter epochs more than 10,000 years ago. Suddenly, water that had taken millennia to accumulate could be pulled up in minutes. The transformation was staggering. In the 1980s and 90s, vast wheat fields appeared in the central Najd region. These lush green circles, visible even from space, were irrigated entirely by fossil groundwater. At peak production in the early 1990s, Saudi Arabia became self-sufficient in wheat and even exported over 4 million tons annually. While often cited as a net exporter, this status varied by year and is debated due to concurrent grain imports. By the early 2000s, satellite monitoring revealed alarming declines. Between 2000 and 2015, key aquifers like the Sak and the Tabuk showed water tables falling by over 60 meters in some regions. The drawdown far outpaced natural recharge. Alarmed, the Saudi government began scaling back. In 2015, it officially ended wheat subsidies, acknowledging that the grain boom was unsustainable in such a water-starved land. Agricultural policy pivoted sharply. The focus shifted towards greenhouse-grown vegetables, drip irrigation, and water-smart crops like barley and dates. Yet, agriculture still guzzles over 80% of the kingdom's total water withdrawals. That imbalance forced Saudi Arabia to invest in the only water source it could guarantee, salt water. Desalination became their technological lifeline. Today, it produces about 9 million cubic meters of fresh water per day, accounting for roughly 20% of global desalinated output. Plants like Ras Al Khair, the largest in the world, force seawater through fine membranes using intense pressure, stripping out salt and other minerals. The result? Clean, drinkable water piped inland, including a 200 km stretch to the capital, Riyadh. But desalination brings its own challenges. Every drop produced requires energy, often from burning oil or gas, and leaves behind super-concentrated brine. This salty waste, when dumped into the Persian Gulf or Red Sea, disrupts marine ecosystems, stressing coral reefs and altering coastal salinity gradients. The process, while vital, can't scale infinitely without ecological cost. Looking ahead, solar-powered desalination could offer a cleaner path, though commercial-scale adoption remains limited due to technical and cost hurdles. That's where innovation steps in. One of the most ambitious efforts was the $1.5 billion NEOM Zero Liquid Discharge Desalination Project. Though the NEOM desalination project was shelved in 2024 due to cost and logistical setbacks, 
Its modular, closed-loop design, where brine would be remined for useful minerals, lives on in smaller test facilities. At the same time, the National Water Company is rolling out smart meters across major cities. These digital devices track household usage in real time and apply tiered pricing. After rates increased in 2023, water use in Riyadh dropped by 15% within a single year. Cultural barriers are also shifting. Once taboo, the reuse of treated sewage water is now common and climbing. In 2022, around 30% of all municipal wastewater was recycled. By 2030, the goal is 90%. This water, while unsuitable for drinking, irrigates public parks, cools industrial systems, and supports agriculture, easing the load on freshwater supplies. Still, despite drawing from aquifers, desalination plants, and sewage recycling, Saudi Arabia's water system teeters on a tightrope. Population growth and mega-projects like NEOM and The Line will bring millions of new residents. Demand is rising faster than supply. With ancient groundwater reserves dwindling and an energy transition underway, Saudi planners now stress that efficiency, not expansion, is the path forward. Because in a land without rivers, every sip of water depends not just on what can be pumped, but how wisely it's used. What do you think? Can a country without rivers really thrive in the long run? Let's hear your thoughts, and don't forget to follow us for more fascinating global stories.